to talk about um, the short story by Edwige Stantica that um, you were supposed to read this week. And since we did not have a class this week, I just wanted to talk about some of the themes um, that we find here. Now, there is a close connection uh, with the Haitian Revolution and this particular short story. Um, this story was uh, published in Edwige Danticat's um, collection of short stories in 1995. Um, the collection was called Crick Crack and it was shortlisted for National Book Award. Um, and so um, let's talk a little bit about the Haitian Revolution. Of course, you can watch the video. Um, but, you know, just to give you uh, the basic information. So the Haitian Revolution is considered to be the first successful revolution that, it, that was led by the slaves. Um, and then it eventually gave rise to the free nation of Haiti where the slaves came to power. So it is extremely significant. It has a lot of historical uh, value. Um, and, and that's the reality, right, that is built in in the story. So if you, um, you know, watch the video, um, you would know that, you know, sugar plantation was the main source um, in, in the colony of Saint-Domingue, uh, and there were four different classes uh, there at the time. So there was, uh, there were, you know, white planters, and then, uh, you know, beneath the white planters, um, there were wealthy, free people of color who were also owners of plantation, slaves, etc. And then beneath them, you had the poor whites or the petite blanc, um, you know, who um, were, almost work like, you know, indentured workers uh, for the white planters and the wealthy uh, free people of color. And then beneath uh, them, um, there were the slaves that were not considered, you know, human beings. Um, and, and so when uh, the early revolution started uh, when, um, you know, people started hearing about the French Revolution and their fight for equality, fraternity, and egality, right? And in 1791, um, the slaves um, started revolting against the, the plantation owners and their masters uh, because they realized that... Um, you know, this is like a cycle of slavery. And if it's, it's you know, if they're not the one to take uh, control of their lives, um, uh, the promise that the French people, the promise of democracy that the French people were having in France would never be given to them. So under the leadership of Troussaint Louverture, um, you know, the Haitian Revolution took place. Um, and then Louverture became such a successful general. He became an officer of the Spanish military. Um, and he was responsible for, you know, bringing the Haitian Revolution to a successful end. And then Jacques Desalines, um, who later on worked as a general of Louverture, um, eventually, you know, he succeeded him after Louverture was captured and, um, and, and, you know, put to death. Now, Dati Bookman, right? So Dati Bookman is mentioned in this particular story. He was also a major leader who played a key part in the Haitian Revolution. And so Bookman's speech becomes very important in this story. Now, as I said, you know, this story was published in 1995. So this is a, a new modern Haiti that we are looking at. And, you know, from the story, we know that um, you know, there are uh, there are three characters, right? So there's Guy, the husband, Lily is the wife, and, and uh, little Guy is um, the boy. Um, and so they live in abject poverty, right? So they don't have enough food. There is mention of extreme scarcity of food, um, you know, when they're hungry. I mean, there are days when they just... Uh, you know, boil some, um, you know, sugarcane juice and then, you know, put some salt under their tongue, you know, just to get by. Um, there is no electricity, so, you know, they have to light up kerosene lamps. Even water is scarce. Uh, so remember, um, you know, Lily uh, walks uh, almost a mile or more to get, you know, fresh drinking water for the family. So this is the shanty town of Haiti. Um, where everybody, uh, you know, lives in abject poverty. 
um, and you know this is and this is normalized right uh, because nobody is complaining um, nobody is complaining about the hardships and there is love so if you look at the interaction between um, guy and lily uh, and also their son uh, we know that there is a lot of love for the family um so uh, what i want to do is to take a closer look at the story um so then you know we know that the little guy is in a play and he is playing the 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 role of uh dati bookman uh and then the lines become very very crucial right so um you know this is actually the first set of lines um so bookman a wall of fire rising so this is the first time that we uh, get to know the title of this short story and uh, the wall of fire, fire rising again refers back to the um, haitian revolution when the the slaves you know the, the revolters they started setting fire in the sugar plantation um, and, and so fire becomes a symbol of hope and freedom and the audacity to to you know to dream big um so what happens is right after um you know little guy recites his line um read the response of his parents right i mean they have a, a very emotional response to the the boy um you know um and then even guy is so emotional that he has to you know uh, turn turn away his face in order to fight his tears and so on and so we know that somehow in their mind the separation between dati bookman and the little boy has lost and so the, the little boy becomes an extension of bookman himself and what he stood for um now let's look at the symbolism of the sugar cane um here um you know edwish dantigat paints a, a very um realistic picture of the shanty town right so the sugar mill um there is a huge television screen in you know in front of the iron grill gates uh where state sponsored news is shown every night right so right here near the sugar mill we know that you know there is a huge screen where all the people in the shanty town gather at night and they um listen to the news that the government wants them to know um so again uh we know that this is indoctrination um this is autocratic control this is mind control the government is controlling the narrative um and they uh they they are controlling the narrative that people that they want that they want the people sh should know however you know this uh this technique fails right because right here um dandigat mentions they made bonfires with dried sticks corn husk and paper um cursing the authorities under their breath right so they so the people the the people who who are extremely poor um living in oppressive situation in the shanty town they can see through um the government's um you know they can see through the veneer of lies that the government is is showing them um and so they are very you know intelligent people and so the tactic of mind control doesn't really work for the government now who are the owners of this um, sugar cane sugar mill um they're not haitian right so we know asad who is uh, who is an arab of lebanese or palestinian descent and they've been living in haiti for many years um so he is you know an arab haitian who has a lot of money um and you know who owns the sugar mill and the sugar mill is the only source of employment um for the people right and we also know that people work here um you know in a in a generational uh, manner so you know if the father is working in the sugar mill then you know after he passes away the job goes to the son and then so on and so forth um and lily does not want um you know guy to put their son's name in the list of government jobs so that i mean she really doesn't want little guy to end up working um you know in the, in the sugar mill and so there is a conflict um of um, expectation here that we you know that we know from the rest of the story 
the hot air balloon also becomes symbolic of the audacity, right? Because, uh, you know, the balloon flying in the air, of course, it represents uh, freedom. Uh, but but also the fact that, you know, Guy really wants to fly the balloon without understanding the mechanism, right? I mean, that is his desire, his intense desire to escape from this oppressive situation and to be a man, right, in front of his um, son's eyes, which is very important um, theme in the story. It reminds us of Walter Younger. Right. So when I read the story, I was reminded of certain imageries that we read in A Raisin in the Sun, because remember, Walter Younger also gambles his gambles away the money, not because he's selfish, but, you know, his because of his tremendous desire to become something else, to become something new, which Guy mentions in the story. Um. All right, so finally we know that Guy um, has found uh, a temporary job. He has to clean, um, you know, toilets in the sugar mill. And we also know that there is, you know, a lot of competition. You know, government jobs are, you know, scarce. And, of course, everybody is trying to find one, um, which actually creates um, a class division, right? So we clearly have, you know, this um, upper class, you know, um, who are rich, who have generational wealth, uh, and then people um, who work for them, you know, who, who work for them um, in a different capacity. Um, so the, the fieldsman or the, or the person who takes care of the balloon, I mean, they are salaried people, so they have some money, right? So we can call them, you know, middle class and then you have, um, you know, Guy and Lily and his family and many other families who are living in a shanty town who have nothing, right? So they are they live in abject poverty and they are the majority of the people. So wealth is concentrated in the hands of few individuals who may not be originally um, Haitian. Um, all right. And then if you look at page 153... Um, Guy mentions that um, there are, you know, if so, you know, this is a, this is Guy talking to Lily and telling her, you know, how she, uh, how he really wants to fly the balloon, and he he thinks that he knows how to fly it and so on because he has watched somebody else flying it, right? Uh, and so Lily is uh, Lily is scared because you know Lily says to him that have you ever thought you know what what would happen if you if you fall down you're gonna hurt yourself you're probably gonna die um, and then of course you know guy doesn't even think about these things uh, and you know and he says um, but look what he gave us instead he gave us reasons to want to fly he gave us the air the birds and our sun so again you know. Um, for, for both um, Guy and Lily, their son becomes a symbol of hope. Um, and they're almost living a life vicariously uh, by looking at, you know, his performance in the play and through the lines that he recites every night for the parents. Um, and then we hear extreme frustration, right? So Lily... Um, so here is, you know, pay attention to, um, you know, the dialogue that is happening between the husband and wife regarding their son. So um, this is Lily. Our son, your son, do you want him cleaning latrines? He can do other things. Me too. I can do other things too. So this is Guy's extreme frustration. We know that, you know, he's an intelligent man. Uh, we know that he has a lot of imagination. He has a lot of hopes. He really does not want to stay in the shanty town for the rest of his life because we also know, I mean, later on in the story, he mentions that, you know, when I think about my father, I think about a failed uh, man, a man who has always struggled um, his entire life, and I really don't want to become my father for my son, right? So that gives him motive for what he does in the, you know, what he does uh, at the end of the story. 
um, because otherwise, if we really don't understand his motives, his intention, his pain, his anguish, his angst, we really uh, we cannot really understand the reason why he committed suicide in the end. Um, now again, you know the um, the little boy comes, and you know the parents are thrilled because he has got uh, more lines for the play. Um, and then now, you know, Bookman's speech becomes very important here. I'm trying to find out uh, because in a, here he mentions that we may either live freely or we should die, right? And that becomes a premonition um, of what is going to happen in the end uh, because right here. So this is the second speech. Um, that the guy, that you know, little guy recites for his parents, and he mentions here, um, I call on her mighty and the weak. I call on everyone and anyone, so that we shall all let out one piercing cry, that we may either live freely or we should die. Now, in the context of the Haitian Revolution, we understand how powerful this might be for the for the slaves to hear these words and then rise up and revolt to come out of their um, slavery um, and so um, because the parents have started seeing their little boy as an extension of bookman to them these words speak volume right and it really hits um, guy um, and I think for the first time he understands the 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 weight of being free Right. So he realizes that the life that they are leading is not free. I mean, um, you know, of course, you know, um, they're not slaves, but then somebody uh, or a group of people are actually controlling their lives through um, wealth, um, through employment, through opportunities. Right. So they're not leading. They're not free, you know, in their own country. And I think that really gives them motivation um, to do what he does in the end. Um, he also says that mostly you want me to feel like a man, right? Remember, so we really don't know what happens to Guy at work. We know that he got a new job and he was supposed to clean the toilets and the sugar mill, but something must have happened, right? Because from, if you read um, page 154 and 155 very closely, you will see that there is a change in attitude. Um, so when Guy comes in home, um, you know, usually we see him happy um, and, you know, he is in a good spirit. So, you know, he is playing with his son. He is very, you know, loving towards his wife. But um, that day onwards, you know, there is a change. So Guy becomes very, um, you know, inward. He is reserved. You know, he it seems like he's constantly thinking. So something must have happened at work. We don't know why, but something and but we know that, you know, his his spirits are crushed and he's not the same man. So um, that night, you know, when the couples are having a conversation, he mentions that, um, you know, uh, he, he tells Lily that I know you are uh, brave. I know you're strong enough to um, handle what might happen. Um, and then Lily gets scared. And then, you know, Guy tells Lily, but mostly I know that you want things from me. I know you want to live in a, a good house. I know you want us to come out of this situation. Um, but mostly you want me to feel like a man. Right? I think it's somewhere down here. I know you can take things as they come. Uh, and then he also mentions that a man is judged by his deeds. And here he mentions, I remember my father who was a very, who was a very poor struggling man all his life. I remember him as a man that I would I would never want to be, right? So again, we know what might have led to that drastic um, decision. Um, and then the balloon ride, right? The, the suicide, the way I look at it, becomes an act of revolt, right? I mean, this is his own way of getting his dignity back because for the first time he is doing things that nobody expects him to do right remember how people were cheering him from the ground um so for a fleeting moment you know he achieves the fame or he achieves uh you know the dignity the humanity um that he has longed for you know all his life 
um, and then Assad and the foreman surprise, uh, you know, when they see the, the balloon flying, Assad cannot even imagine, you know, how one person can fly a balloon. So, of course, we know that, you know, a guy must be really um, intelligent and he must be good um, at, uh, I mean, he, he could have been an engineer, right, because it, it looks like he really understands um, machines and, and, and mechanisms of machines and so on. Um, and so the disruption in their mundane lives, even though fleeting, becomes symbolic of that audacity, right? That audacity to dream big. Um, and then in the end, we see, you know, when little guy sees his father's body right here, he starts reciting the lines of Dati Bookman, a wall of fire rising and in the ashes, I see the bones of my people, right? And, and again, you know, that the same line that we may either live freely or we should die. So, uh, uh, you know, it comes to a full circle, right? Again, we, again, you know, I mean, um, through, through death, you know, by, by committing suicide, um, uh, you know, what um, Guy was probably trying to tell his son that it is possible, right? It is possible to dream big and what is most important is not to accept your present situation but have the audacity or have the capacity to dream big because only if you dream big you can actually aspire to become something. You can have the, the, the power to come out of the situation and be something. And I think for the first time, I mean, you know, little guy is, is too young, but then um, I think he's starting to understand what his father did. Um, and, and so, uh, uh, again, you know, to him, to, um, to, a, to, to the son, I think the father, uh, he, he started to, I mean, the, the reason that he starts reciting um, Dati Bookman's lines, but I, because I think he was seeing parallel between his father's death and that of um, Dati Bookman, right? So the father's death, the act of flying a balloon, the act of doing something um, transgressive, right? Um, that gives a lot of hope, not only to the little boy, but to everybody living in that shanty town, that maybe they need to take control of their lives. Maybe they need to do something that nobody ex you know, um, ex uh, expects them to do. Um, thematically, again, this story reminds me of Harlem, um, especially the lines that, you know, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it explode or, um, or becomes a dried raisin? And then, of course, a raisin in the sun, you know, Guy always reminds me of Walt... Uh, Walter Younger, his dreams and aspirations and how um, his oppressive reality um, stands opposed to that. So um, pay very close attention to the story, um, you know, because at the very end, the story might seem to be uh, like we really don't know what is the actual motive of um, Guy. Like why would he, you know, commit suicide in the end? But I think if you read in between the lines, you can understand like what might drive, you know, a happy, apparently happy person um, like Guy to take a drastic decision like that.